Welcome to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. The latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Here's co-host Jeff Jackson. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's program. How are you this morning, Archbishop? Fine, Jeff, fine. And yourself? I'm fine. Are you getting ready? Are you getting the turkey and everything ready? Are you? We are. I love Thanksgiving, as I think most people do. You know, it's um, it's the only actual kind of secular holiday that is derivative from kind of religious roots. And it's uh, really interesting the way uh, Americana has kind of responded basically to Thanksgiving. At the heart of it is a, a nation giving gratitude to God, you know, and I think that's that's really key. And it's, it's wonderful that as a national holiday that we all basically can come together from various denominations and, you know, various cultural um, uh, backgrounds and s- stop on this day and, and give thanks to God. But, there, there's an, a need to be, to be home. I, I think Thanksgiving and Christmas, those are the, the two times. There's a need to be home, you know. When I studied over in, uh, in Paris, uh, it was interesting that uh, they didn't understand Midwesterners. You know, they, the, I, I think the <laughs> Parisians had, because the Parisians would say, you know, they're they're here in in France. They're here studying in in Paris, and all we hear they have to get back for the for the summer picnic. You know, <laughs> you know, it's pretty jolly. What, what is this summer picnic? <laughs> and that's what they thought of as that's Thanksgiving. Right. Um, it's also a time of year when sports are big, obviously. Sure, football and Marquette basketball season is starting, which is a perfect segue into our first guest this morning, who is the twenty fourth president of Marquette. It was inaugurated just back in December, and that is Dr. Michael Lavelle. Good, good morning, Dr. Lavelle, and thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your your faith story, your upbringing as a Catholic, and and uh, maybe your Thanksgivings with your uh, with your Catholic family. Sure. You know, I I grew up in a um, kind of a mixed religious home. My my father was Catholic, and my mother was Protestant, and so. Uh, as a child, I we spent time in both churches, and it wasn't until I was older and I uh, was a teenager and I was able to make a decision myself uh, to which church I wanted to belong to, so I, I was really drawn to the Catholic faith. I always had an affinity towards Mary, and kind of the um, the practices of the Catholic faith were something that I was drawn to, and so I really became, uh, I think my faith journey really was strengthened when I went to college and uh, took part in the Newman Center at the University of Pittsburgh, and it was you know, that really made a, a big impact on my life. I got to know uh, the priests and, and several of the, the novices that were there. They became my good friends. And uh, it just, uh, I still keep in touch with Father Brian Summers uh, today, who was my spiritual advisor and helped me make every major decision in my life. It's very interesting you say the Newman Center because it's, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't think that um, at least on at least the, the the Catholic experience in the pews, in the, in the parish, they would think in terms of the impact of a Newman Center. They would kind of think, well, there's just a chaplain there and chaplain's there to help the, the students out. But the real impact that it's made during that period of time in the life of a student is is almost critical. Well, when you think about when you're in college, it's you know, the first time you're going out on your own as a young adult, and you're trying to find yourself. And to be able to have a Newman Center that then becomes that religious anchor that carries with you uh, for the rest of your life during that formative time, because it's the first time in your life that you're making your own decisions. You're not dependent on your family, on, you know, where you go to church and, you know, when you go to church. And so uh, Newman Centers can play a, a really important uh, role, I think, when we think about the next generation of, of Catholics as they become adults and the tens of thousands of, actually hundreds of thousands of students that are on colleges, campuses that have access to Newman Center, how big a role that can play. It, 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 it's, you know, one of the things that um, um, I've appreciated um, um, from your leadership, uh, Dr. Lovell, he, even even when, and you may not know this, Jeff, but this is the former president of UW-Milwaukee. So right. I would go over to the Newman Center and, and who was there with his wonderful wife was, you know, mm-hmm. Dr. Dr. Lovell. Uh, but one of the things I've appreciated is you're, you're not afra- afraid to wear your Catholic identity, your, your Catholicism. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not afraid to basically put it out there. I, I thought that was very interesting, especially I was fortunate enough to be, pre- uh, to be present at uh, Dr. Lovell's inauguration. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm sure the hallowed halls of uh, Marquette heard for the first time 
the president talking about his wife and children. Right. You know, I mean, this <laughs> first. is you know, this, this, uh, so you actually have the first layman, you know, who, who was there. But it, one of the great things is um, Dr. Lovell was uh, during out uh, throughout the inauguration was not afraid to talk about basically the impact of Catholicism on his own life. And um, uh, and you even had your you even had your kind of personal chaplain there with you. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Father Brian did come and was part of the ceremony. Actually, he, he did the Mass on Thursday that was part of the inauguration as well. And, you know, it, it's great for me because even when I was in college, you know, one of the things that we, we joked around, they were trying to, you know, recruit me to come live in their house and, and consider being a priest, which I, I did, but obviously I had a different vocation with my wife, Amy, and, and being a father. Uh, it's great for me. I've always wanted to talk about my faith publicly and, and share you know, my experiences and my journey. And so now being a president of Marquette University, the Catholic Joseph Institution, I can do that in a, a very public way. Whereas being at a public institution like UWM, the obviously I could go to the Newman Center. I, I met with the students. I talked to the students many times as a witness, but I couldn't do it you know, publicly in my role there. Talk to me a little bit about your um, um, uh, basically academic ra- uh, background, which is really founded in the hard science of basically engineering. Yeah. And and uh, tell me, what perspectives does that bring to um, uh, to being a, a, a college president? You know, I mean, well, obviously, if you were a philosopher, we would kind of yeah. know that, or your person of literature. But you know, the hard science like engineering, what does that bring to the to the perspective? Well, I think you know one of the unique things that I have and the skills that I have, you know, obviously, I, I, I have some different talents than you know a Jesuit would be bringing to the table. One of the things I think about innovation or entrepreneurship has been part of my background. And you know, I've been part of starting seven or eight companies. My technology has been licensed. And so I have a, a unique perspective on ways that we can maybe be more innovative, both as an institution and the classroom, not in necessarily starting companies, but the way we do things and deliver um, uh, classes for students, the way that we give opportunities to them to be successful and really make an impact on the lives of others. And I think students today, particularly on our campus, are, are so engaged in, in service and social innovation. And so this is something that I believe that, you know, with my background, I can uh, do some unique things to help our campus be more successful in providing those opportunities for students, even in the fact that, uh, as I announced my inauguration, we raised $5 million dollars for an innovation fund on campus where we're looking for ideas from anyone on the campus, particularly our, our students, our faculty and staff, in ways that they can make an impact in their lives and others in really unique ways we haven't done before. But that was just one of several initiatives. I mean, I was kind of a little floored uh, by the fact that you just rolled out, you know, a number of uh, uh, initiatives at, um, at Marquette and also kind of like um, tweaking those who would say, well, now you're in engineering. We'll never hear anything, you know, about the, um, from the liberal arts side. We'll never hear anything in terms of literature. But you kind of dispel those uh, those fears right away. Would you talk yeah. about some of those other ones? Well, the um, the. The one most specifically uh, I think you're referring to was we we announced the Center for the Advancement of the Humanities. And this was the very first thing I announced, you know, as as the as a big initiative as being President Mark Cambridge, which was very important, again, getting back to what it means to give a Catholic Jesuit education its the core. It's in the humanities and in the liberal arts. And you know, we're trying to create global citizens that are making a difference in the lives of others. And the critical thinking skills, the the social awareness, all of those things, you know, are part of liberal arts education. And so I'm a huge believer that we're not going to ever get away from doing that because it's what we're called to do, uh, not only as a university, but as a society. And I still think that the strength of higher education in the U.S. is the fact that we still focus on the strong liberal arts education. Now, it didn't come easy to saying yes to uh, to Marquette. Mm-hmm. You know, there were, it was, a you know, a, um, uh, an aspect of, of struggle in the decision. I, I'm, you had you know, accolades, you know, when you were at um, uh, at um, uh, UW-Milwaukee. Um, but suddenly they were kind of wooing you over to, to Marquette. What went into your decision to say, oh, okay, I'll do it? Because I, I know that wasn't kind of a, you were kind of a reluctant Yeah, I, I mean, things were going well, you know, UW-Milwaukee. It was very comfortable for me. You know, we had been, we had a lot of great initiatives being launched um, particularly around water and some other things. So we, but I felt like, you know, I was making an impact. And so when I was approached by Marquette University, you know, I, my, my immediate reaction was, was no. And I said no to, I think, four or five times different people that approached me. 
Uh, but it really wasn't until Father Wild talked to me, and he didn't. Father Wild, yes. right, where you make sure you have that deep voice when you're talking about him, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, when he um, <clears throat> when he approached me and said, you know, you really, he'd like, you know, I'd really like you to stand before God and, you know, you know, ask God, you know, what will give you the most fulfillment in your life and your career and where he wants you. And it wasn't until I actually really started reflecting and discerning, you know, where I was meant to be or where I would make the most impact in my life that I became serious about the idea of going to Marquette University. And and it was, I, I you know, I joked around, I was, I was still communicating with Father Brian Summers on a daily basis, my spiritual advisor, and we were talking to each other about what message we were seeing, what we were hearing, and talking about our dreams. And, uh, you know, we were waiting for some lightning bolt or something to say, listen, this is what you want to go. And it never came. You know, that was something that, he, that um, the only thing Father Brian had, he said two nights in a row, you know, God was telling him I need him, but Father Brian was saying, well, where? And, <laughs> and uh, he was never getting that message. But uh, as Amy and my wife and I prayed about this, uh, we really just came to a sense of peace over time that this is really what we were being called to do. And because uh, initially when I was thinking about it, I really was, I had that internal struggle, you know, and uh, because I knew it was going to be a difficult decision, you know, I'd be just moving across town. There'd be a lot of people in my, you know, in Milwaukee that would probably wouldn't understand or maybe, you know, disappointed in the fact that I was going across town. And and, you know, feeling like I was, you know, leaving people that were counting on me was, was difficult. But ultimately, you know, I knew this is what I was being called to do. Great discussion. We're talking with Marquette University President Dr. Michael Lovell. We'll be back in a moment with news from around the Archdiocese and more of our discussion with Dr. Lovell. You're listening to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki. We'll be right back. Are you a registered nurse or are you a certified nursing assistant? Would you enjoy working in a fully Catholic environment? St. Anne's Rest Home is hiring registered nurses and CNAs. The mission of St. Anne's Rest Home is to provide high quality care to the elderly. And that would be where you come in, as a registered nurse or nursing assistant. St. Anne's has provided faithful care of the elderly for over 68 years. Located on the near south side of Milwaukee, close to the expressway and surrounded by beautiful county parks. St. Anne's offers a loving atmosphere for residents and employees alike. If you're a registered nurse or certified nursing assistant, why not consider working in a Catholic atmosphere? Learn more by calling 414-383-2630. That's 414-383-2630. Or go to relevantradio.com and enter the keyword nursing. Relevantradio.com, keyword nursing. For the third weekend of November, as we celebrate three wonderful feasts, the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Cecilia, and Christ the King, good morning. I'm Grace David with headlines from the Catholic Herald and catholicherald.org. Get ready, it's official. This week, Pope Francis announced that he's coming to the United States. The Pope says he's attending the 2015 World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia in September. Philadelphia's Archbishop broke the news earlier this year, but the Holy Father finally shared his official public confirmation on Monday. As of right now, there aren't any additional cities on the itinerary for this special visit. This is Pope Francis's first pastoral trip to the U.S. Read more about the Pope's plans in the Catholic Herald and at catholicherald.org. In local news, Father Benjamin Reese of Kenosha is heading to India for an experimental ALS treatment. This trip is thanks in part to a fundraiser from his parishioners. Diagnosed in 2013, Father Ben is all set to participate in a $40,000 STEM trial in Pune, India, later this month. Reese is in residence at Our Lady of Mount Carmel and also serves St. Therese. He shared the news of his upcoming trip in their bulletins on November 2nd. The ailing priest says it's now or never, based upon recommendations from his doctors, after lots of prayer, and after talking with his family and friends. ALS is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. He says his treatment will utilize bone marrow and aligns with Catholic teaching. For more on how you can help, visit catholicherald.org. As Europeans mark the 25th anniversary of the fall of communism, a cardinal and a historian are speaking out about the contributions of the Catholic Church. The men want to ensure that the Catholic Church's role is recognized and remembered. Prague Cardinal Dominic Duca and Polish historian Jan Zarin say that St. John Paul II was instrumental in promoting human and civil rights. This was at a time when the appeal of Marxism was fading, and the Pope joined world leaders in the global fight against it. Read more about this compelling story in this week's Catholic Herald. Well, good news is in the air for allergy sufferers attending Mass. 
if billowing clouds of incense force you or someone you know to leave there's now an alternative available rather than eliminating the ancient symbolic ritual of sensing a nun says she's discovered a hypoallergenic substitute mercy sister janice marie johnson is recommending trinity brand a company she found online johnson says the incense comes in several options including one named flowers another called forest and she says the lightest fragrance is called powder incense is used at mass for purification and sanctification the thanksgiving holiday serves as a reminder of all of our blessings as we prepare to welcome guests and enjoy wonderful meals many of us realize that we have a lot for which to be thankful as catholics we learn to understand the importance of gratitude as the core of catholicism is the eucharist a greek word that means thanksgiving so every time we celebrate mass we are giving thanks to our lord and savior jesus christ Thanksgiving Day Mass Times can be found at archmill.org. Remember, you can connect with us 24 hours a day at catholicherald.org. I'm Grace David, and now we return to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Lestecki. Welcome back to Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Lestecki. We're talking with Marquette University President Dr. Michael Lovell. Um, Dr. Lovell, we're really pleased that you're here. You know, it's a wonderful thing, um, uh, uh, Dr. Lovell, that uh, you, you talk in terms of how influential uh, uh, faith is. Uh, you've got one of the most beautiful spots that I think in, in all of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, and that's that, that little St. Joan of Arc Chapel. You've, you, you've obviously been there. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's just a fantastic place. And, you know, they have a lot of masses there during the week. And during the weeknights, there's actually mass at, at 10 o'clock. And uh, there's a a real following for the Tuesday night at 10 o'clock mass, which I go to as many times as I can it allows in my schedule. And uh, it's, it's great because we have, there's room for maybe a hundred people in the chapel. That's with all the chairs out. And, and uh, we get about 200 students that come and they file out the, 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 the back, the back of the church and sit on the, uh, you know, kind of the, the area right, right out the back. And we actually have a speaker out there and just the, the sense uh, that you have there, the the Holy Spirit being there, and just this the sense of that community and the power. They just there's so much energy in, involved. They have great uh, music, and uh, a couple of young priests uh, usually do the mass, and so it's just something special about Marquette. When you talk in terms of uh, that special aspect, the special characteristic of the the community, there is really a sense of kind of uh, of being family. Yeah. Um, and uh, there is a sense in in within that religious uh, context of the responsibility that that each of us has for one another and yeah. the bond is even even greater when you're basically sharing you know three four five and and maybe many more years of your life with that particular um, uh, particular group uh, tell me a little bit something about the the, the Marquette family in the yeah. sense that you felt about it. well it's interesting when I I remember when I was first named uh, back in March I probably in the first two days I had upwards of 200 people telling me welcome to the family and at the time not being part of the community I thought they were just words and then but once you arrive on the campus and you're engaged with the faculty staff students and alumni you realize it really is a family and this is my fourth academic institution and I've never been anywhere where people have cared as much about each other and cared about the institution as much as they do at Marquette University and you know you I see you know someone asked me is there something that's happened since I was named that let me know that I made the right choice and the reality is something happens every day that I see the way people care about each other and interact that makes me know that I'm at the right place. We saw that wonderful aspect in um, uh, the life of the reporter Foley yeah. who, who, who came in. How, how did that make you feel as, as president? Well, first, it, it was amazing to me to see the way that the Marquette community rallied around James Foley. And um, we saw it in, in a lot of different ways, but I think it was really exemplified when we had uh, a vigil for him. And uh, we had over a thousand people, you know, jam the Jesu, you know, for, for uh, the vigil. And, you know, at the ceremony, you know, I was looking out and seeing there was over a hundred of his classmates that had come from all over the country just to be there. So this is how much they cared for him and how much they supported uh, him and his family. And I remember at one point I looked out and I, I saw a group of the individuals were wearing their he played rugby, were wearing the rugby jerseys mm -hmm. and over 20 years old. And it just kind of gave me chills, you know, to think, you know, how much that he meant to them and how much Mark, the Marquette community, you know, they were there to support, you know, each other. 
We hear a lot about um, uh, the Marquette community doing a, a great deal of social outreach, yeah. um, which comes right, at the, I guess, at the heart of maybe Jesuit education. You know, you have yeah. the Jesuit volunteers, um, you have um, individuals who kind of basically reach out to, to serve um, a, a community. It seems to be embedded in the, the, the spirit. Yes. And, and actually, if you can go back to James Foley, you know, he really embodied, you know, what it means to be part of the Marquette community because he lived his life to benefit of others and, and told a story for people that couldn't tell their own story. And we think about our student body population today, uh, as far as the 28 Catholic Jesuit institutions, we have more students on a percentage basis doing service than any of the other Jesuit institutions. And I would argue that Jesuit institutions do more service and than, than other. all other universities. So, so I think our student body does as much, if not more service uh, to others. Uh, than any other university in the country. And, you know, that makes me, you know, I feel very proud of our university. And we really are trying uh, to build students that will go out and, and be the difference in the world and, and really live their lives so that others' lives will be better. Now, you're being a public person, you know, the, a lot of your private life is going to be uh, is going to be right out there in the open. You, um, speak a little bit about your wife and your children. Sure, yeah. So I'm a wife, uh, Amy and I have been uh, married to, uh, 21 years, and uh, we've been blessed with four, uh, four terrific children. My oldest daughter is a, a sophomore at Marquette. She's 19, and I have a, a 16-year-old son who's at Marquette High and a 14-year-old daughter who's at uh, in school in Whitefish Bay, and my youngest son, Kevin's 11, and he's at Holy Family in Whitefish Bay. Now, your wife has kind of a, a special interest, and really kind yeah. of her heart goes out. Well, you know, she, she, was, she was a pharmacist. We actually met when she was in pharmacy school, and I was in engineering school in Pittsburgh, and uh, she practiced pharmacy for a number of years, but as we had more children and my job got bigger, she cut back and can you cut back her hours and so that she um, she no longer is a practicing pharmacist. But uh, uh, she had two jobs as a pharmacist where she worked in a psychiatric hospital. And she actually, um, as part of that, was actually on the floor for psychiatric wing for children. And so she became very interested in mental health issues. And, uh, and so uh, just recently, uh, uh, a year ago last summer, we had on the North Shore where we lived, I think we had five or six suicides. And so uh, she and uh, some other people, she started a um, nonprofit called Red Gen, which is really about uh, creating resiliency for youth around particularly mental health issues and uh, really helping, you know, train students how to cope with some of the pressures that they're facing and help them realize when some of their friends, you know, maybe in, in, in times of need in terms of mental health issues and also, you know, training, you know, teachers and other, you know, adults that could be, you know, help be caring individuals that can be trusted adults to help these children make it through some difficult times they may be facing. You know, the um, there is a particular avocation's ability to uh, uh, to relax as, um, uh, in the tough job as a, a present. Your avocation seems to be a little a thing called running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, a little running club. You know, I mean, there was when it was even there for the um, installation. They were heralding you. You you went out and ran that that morning, yeah. didn't yeah, you? That's yeah, yeah. That morning. You know, what's this obsession with running? Are you no. uh, you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> I can understand if you're yeah. a politician, yeah. but what's this obsession with yeah. you running? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I, when I even when I uh, was at UWM and became became the chancellor over there. You know, I made a kind of a pact with myself that, you know, I, the one thing I was not going to give up was exercise because I think just, again, for so many reasons for physical and mental health and, you know, the difficulties that these jobs create that, you know, I, I, I learned very early on, you can work 24 hours and never really get, get everything done that you want to accomplish. And so if you don't carve time out, you know, for exercise and other, other things to help you, then, then uh, you could let it slip away pretty quickly. And so... Uh, one of the things that, that I've done is been able to try to incorporate, you know, running and exercise into, you know, my role as the university president. And so one of the things we did is what I've done is I've started a running group on campus. And again, it's another way for me to be part of the community and get to interface with you know, a set of students, you know, faculty and staff that I may never have contact with and get to share with them something that we all enjoy. You know, Archbishop, I... Uh was sharing with Dr. Lovell earlier that my wife and I went over to the Twin Cities recently to see my daughter complete her first marathon, uh, which was an amazing thing to me. I, I was stunned by the amount of determination and, and the sacrifice that is involved. I understand that you have run a number of marathons. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> how many? <laughs> I've done. I've run twenty-seven, and uh, I ran uh, just ran Lakefront uh, this past October. Oh, did you? Yeah, it was my fifth. It was my fifth time, fifth Lakefront, and so. 
again, this is something, one of the things we're doing on the campus is uh, in January, we're going to, we are going to have a team uh, that we're putting together that uh, we're going to all run Lakefront Marathon together and have a, a friendly competition with Concordia University and UWM in terms of the, the team. So I'm expecting to get, I expect us to get probably well over a hundred or so runners, you know, from the campus that we're all trained together. And again, it's, it's great because it's a journey, you know, when you, when you're training for a marathon and it's, it's not easy and it's, it's, again, it's a good way for, uh, you know, all of us, you know, to, to build that sense of community with one another. Now I'm trying to, uh, to, to envision you, Mike, like, um, uh, Sylvester Stallone in the front <laughs> with, uh, with basically a sweatshirt on and uh, the theme from Rocky and the, the background as you're running is a little bit like that where everybody kind of follows you. Uh, well, unfortunately, you know, I, I'm a little bit older now and, and uh, I've slowed down over the past decade or so. And we have a lot of students on the campus that are really fast. And so, uh, what we what we typically do for many of our workouts, we'll just run from the actually from right in front of St. John of Arc Chapel. We'll run over to the track and do a workout on the track. And the nice thing about that is, because it's a track, no matter how fast you are, you're all together, and yeah, so yeah, so yeah. people can go at their own pace and really still stay. Since rather than running through the city where you might have everybody kind of spread out because they're on different paces. Now let me let me put you um, on the spot with a, a question. I, it was a question that was kind of posed to me when I became Arch, uh, Archbishop of Milwaukee and. Uh, and it's strange to ask this question right at the beginning, but what is it that you want to uh, achieve? What is it that you want your your basically legacy to be when you um, uh, when God eventually calls you home, or yeah. or when you, uh, um, uh, another uh, challenge comes up? What do you want? To, what do you want to give and turn over to uh, basically the community at Marquette? Well, it, w- it was really interesting because very early on in my. Uh, in my tenure at Marquette, one of the first interviews I gave, somebody asked me to what define what success was. And I said success was the breadth and the depth and the impact that you make in the lives of others. And so when I think about what my legacy would be at Marquette, would be creating those opportunities for the Marquette community to make an impact in changing the world. And that can come in a lot of different forms. That can come in um, programs where, you know, our students, faculty and staff can make a difference in the Milwaukee community. We want to change Milwaukee for the better. We want to have the outreach and service uh, opportunities. Uh, the United States and the world, you know, we have a lot of things around water and uh, biotechnology and other things that we could create in research and, you know, yeah, you know, outreach. Uh, and so, um, you know, I want, you know, Marquette to be known as a place where if you want to be, make a difference, you know, that you come there and you're going to be successful as a student, but then when you go out into the world, you know, you're going to be a leader in terms of the impact that you make. The one, wonderful aspect is, um, you know, you've you, you've got an institution that has already been uh, heralded as one of the, um, the fine institutions of higher learning, not only in the, in the state of Wisconsin, but in the entire nation. Um, and now, you know, um, you coming there, uh, Dr. Lovell, I, I, you know, I, I think you, you bring a vision um, uh, to, to Marquette, which is only going to add to, to basically that greatness. And I want to thank you and, and your wife for the great uh, contribution and for your family for, for manifesting the um, Catholic identity in, um, um, in a way that's not oftentimes seen in, um, in the public venue. Oh, God, well, God bless you. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate it. And just ask all the, the people listening that if you pray for me to give me the wisdom so that I can lead Marquette to, uh, to really uh, be the type of university that we all know it can be. Thank you so much for joining us, Marquette University President Dr. Mike Lovell. When we come back, we'll have a prayer from the Archbishop. Don't go away. Are you a registered nurse or are you a certified nursing assistant? Would you enjoy working in a fully Catholic environment? St. Anne's Rest Home is hiring registered nurses and CNAs. The mission of St. Anne's Rest Home is to provide high quality care to the elderly. And that would be where you come in as a registered nurse or nursing assistant. St. Anne's has provided faithful care of the elderly for over 68 years. Located on the near south side of Milwaukee, close to the expressway and surrounded by beautiful county parks, St. Anne's offers a loving atmosphere for residents and employees alike. If you're a registered nurse or certified nursing assistant, why not consider working in a Catholic atmosphere? Learn more by calling 414-383-2630 That's 414-383-2630. Or go to relevantradio.com and enter the keyword nursing. Relevantradio.com, keyword nursing. Thanks so much, Dr. Lovell, for joining us this morning. Well, it's great to be here, and I really enjoyed talking with you.
Archbishop, before we close, please lead us in a prayer. Sure. Um, and let's p- pray especially for, for Dr. Lovell as he, um, uh, as he now uh, takes on the responsibility of being president of Marquette University, for the students who are engaged in higher learning, for those who are in Newman centers um, throughout um, um, our, uh, our country, uh, influencing our young people, forming and fashioning them. And so we entrust um, uh, them in prayer to the Blessed Mother, Hail Mary, full of okay. grace, the Lord, the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, women, and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. St. Ignatius, Pray for us, and may God's blessings be upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Archbishop, and thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. I'm Jeff Jackson wishing you a happy weekend. This has been Living Our Faith with Archbishop Jerome Listecki and co-host Bob Bennis. Join us again next week for the latest news, important issues, and stories of Catholics living their faith in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee.